grace and peace in Jesus, our Savior. I remember the first time that I came into the Napa Valley and saw the Napa Valley. It was 20 years ago last month when I was out here for an interview. And I remember driving up Valley. We drove up into the, the hills on the, on the west side, then up into the east side, and, and just being struck by the beauty of this place we're privileged to call home. The hills, the green, the, the, um, the, the, even the wineries themselves, beautiful, and the gardens, just struck by how beautiful. I remember commenting that I, I kind of felt like I was driving around in a postcard. It was beautiful, beautiful. That was 20 years ago. And now, now I drive up Valley. And what's on my mind? It's too much traffic. <laughs> too many cars. That car ahead of me is going slow. I'm thinking about what I've got going on when I get to my destination or something going on later in that evening. Or I'm listening to a book or I'm on a, in a conversation. And I can perfectly capable of driving right on by. All the beauty. All the wonder. Seeing, but not seeing. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know, especially those of you who, who, who work up valley or work up in the hills. Yeah, you see it, but sometimes you just don't see it, oftentimes. This can happen in all kinds of things in life. You spend a lot of time, effort decorating a home or a room and then stop seeing it after a while. call it visual lethargy. That's the name for it. You see something, and then you just kind of get used to it, and then it almost becomes invisible. Those of us who've been worshiping here a while, how many times have you seen these banners on the wall? Many times. They're here all through the spring and the summer. And they're beautiful. They're striking, and, and a beautiful bringing together of the culture and the viticulture of the Napa Valley with the mission of God. And they contain the words that were from our gospel that we just heard. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. It's beautiful, bringing together vineyards and mission and an invitation to pray. How many times are you moved to pray when you see it? I'll be honest, it's been a very long time since I've looked at those, really thought about them, and it leading me as a reminder to pray. I see them all the time, but I don't see them. Can we do that with the message as well? Seeing, but not seeing. It's kind of ironic, in a way, because what's going on here, the context, as we heard in our gospel today, is all about seeing, and really seeing beyond the lethargy, beyond what you're used to, but really seeing What's going on? What is the need? And even who we are. It's about seeing. And it's about discipleship. It is about, really, the heart of it all. Discipleship. Because these are words Jesus spoke to his disciples about what it means to be a disciple. Today we are bringing to a close our series on following Jesus, the marks of discipleship. We have been focusing on what it means to be a Christ follower, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be part of his church, what it means to be a disciple. And we've been seeing in looking at Jesus what it means to follow him. That's the whole point of rabbi and disciple, to imitate the one we're following. And so they've been looking at what Jesus does, 
looking at his competency, looking at his activities, looking at what he intentionally teaches his disciples, and taking from that what he is intentionally calling us to be and teaching us. We've been focusing on seven activities, seven practices, seven habits to be cultivated because they describe in a large part what it means to follow Jesus. We've been talking about being constant in prayer because Jesus was constant in prayer, always talking with his Father, being grounded in the Word, hearing it, reading it, memorizing it, but above all, applying it, obeying it. We've been talking about being faithful in worship as Jesus was faithful in worship, gathering with brothers and sisters to worship. And speaking of gathering together, we've talked about spiritual relationships. Jesus formed his group of 12 and 72 and three. He did his, all of his work with others. And so we too are called to gather together, to pray together, learn together, grow together, serve together in relationship. We talked about serving that we are called to serve as we have been served. Looks like I'm going to need some help, Marty. It's not working. Can you push, go on to the next? There we go. Um, Serving as we've been served. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. So we are are here not to be served, but to serve. And then the last one, oh, look, second last one. Last week we focused on generosity. Jesus, all we have is a result of his generosity. To us, and so we are called to live lives of generosity. And finally, today, wrapping it all together, compassionate witness. We are called as disciples to be his witnesses, but to do so as he does, compassionately. So that's what we've been focusing on, and, and today we're bringing it all together and looking at what Jesus is doing as he says those words, what's happening there. So let's go on to the next. He's teaching, and in his teaching, he's teaching us. So next screen, Marty, please. The first verse, next verse, next one, please, is, is he's describing what's, 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 Matthew's describing what's been going on. It's kind of a summary. When he saw, well, back up one, please. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. This is what Jesus was doing. It's a summary. He is out among the people. He is in word and deed, proclaiming and healing. He's around people who need him, who need healing, who are in a broken world, and who need the good news. And so he's bringing it to them. But what does he see? What does he see as he looks at the people? He's surrounded by crowds almost all the time, except when he is able to slip away for some prayer time with his father or teaching time just with the 12. He's with the crowds, but what does he see beyond what you may just see? Next one, please. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's what he saw. When he sees the people, he sees harassed, helpless, shepherdless, leaderless, that means lost. He sees the brokenness. He sees the need for good news. Is that what I see? Is that what you see? We're surrounded by people. Do we see them? See, I'm called to be a disciple. That means to be like Jesus, and that means to have his eyes and to see as he sees. But do I see that? I was working on this and thinking through this, this message when I was traveling um, this week, when I was on my way back from spending a few days with my parents in Ohio. And, and just as an aside, just thanks again for all the prayers for my mother and for my dad as they, they go through this. I really, really appreciate it. So I'm on my way back flying, and I'm at the air, airport in Cincinnati. I'm at the gate uh, waiting, to, waiting to board. It's going to be a little while. And I'm just looking at my pad out, and I'm thinking through this, these verses and this message and thinking about Sunday and, 
and, and you know, writing about what this, this verse means about seeing as Jesus uh, saw, seeing what people are really are and so forth. I'm thinking, am I doing that? Do I do that? And, and so I, I took a, a, you know, a few months and I closed, moments and I closed my pad and just sat there just looking around. And there are a lot of people there at the gate. Everybody's sitting. Everybody looking at a screen. I tried to look to see if there's anybody I can see that wasn't looking at a screen. I couldn't find anybody. Nobody's talking to anybody. Everybody's looking at a screen. But what do I see? How do I see them? How am I viewing them? What's in my attitude? Am I seeing helpless, broken people? Am I seeing people with things in their lives that I can't see, but everybody's got it, where the brokenness of the world is reached in their, their lives and hurt them? Do I see the helpless? What I saw, what really, honest myself, what was I seeing as I looked around there? What had I been seeing until that moment I got intentional about it? I was indifferent. I was apathetic. I didn't really care. I'm traveling. I'm going home. I got work to do. I got things to think about. I was just hoping that they wouldn't, that, that if there's a really annoying person in this group, that they wouldn't end up sitting next to me on the plane. And since I was flying southwest with open seating, I was really hoping that none of them would take the exit row seat that's real long because, you know, I wanted that one. That's what I was thinking about. I got a long way to go to grow as a disciple who sees as Jesus does. Really, I do. So Jesus says, look at them. They're helpless. And then what he says next, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Switching metaphors, going from shepherding to harvesting, and one that we have a better, better grasp on here in the valley. And what's he saying? He's saying, there's a harvest right in front of me, and I don't have enough workers. Now imagine this. I think we can relate to this or understand it theoretically. It's harvest here in the valley. The vines are looking like what's pictured in the banners. Grapes, ready. The lab says the sugar is just right. The weather's just right. There's rain coming in a couple days, though. The winemaker says, now, now, get the grapes. Pick them now. And the vineyard manager says, I don't have enough workers. I don't have enough workers. What are we going to do? The grapes are there, they're ripe, they're hanging. That's what Jesus sees. That's what he sees. He sees hurting, helpless, hopeless people, and he's filled with compassion for them, but he sees a harvest, and he's saying, I don't, I don't have enough workers. What's going to happen to the grapes if we don't have workers to pick them? Not good things. And it's not going to be good wine. Any workers. This next one, Mark. This isn't the only time Jesus is struck by the urgency of the harvest. In John 4, it tells the story of Jesus and the woman in Samaria. They arrived at this village in Samaria, and the disciples went on into the village to get some food, and Jesus stayed by the well. And there he's talking to a woman, and he sees her. He sees harassed and helpless without a shepherd. And he talks with her. In the course of their conversation, he reveals himself as the Savior. She's excited. She's happy. She runs into town and starts telling people. She becomes a worker in the vineyard. Okay. When the disciples come back, Jesus is talking to them, and this is what he says. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes. And look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. He's saying, can't you see? Are you seeing without seeing? Open your eyes. We need workers. We need workers. 
Next one, please. So, next, next, please. So what he's saying is, what we see in Jesus is he sees the people with compassion. And then, next one, he sees the harvest as urgent. That's what he sees. Now, urgent. Because what we're talking about here is not just getting the grapes at the right time so we get some really good wine. I know that be, would be extremely urgent to the winemaker. Can you imagine? Okay. But we're talking the eternal destiny of people. We're talking people in need of forgiveness, which is only found in Jesus. We're talking people in need of life because all of us have the grave before us. People in need of life and resurrection and that the resurrection and life is only found in him. People in need of hope because this world is so broken and so many dangers, pitfalls, and heartaches. And Jesus is the hope and the way and the truth and the life. It's found in him. The one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. They need me. That's why he's filled with compassion. Or as Peter said, there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It's him. There's an urgency, eternal destiny. There's people who will be lost eternally and cut off from the love of the Father without Jesus. That's the urgency. So we're not, we're not talking about recruiting people for church membership. We're not talking about lining people up on the Christian team. We're talking about the love and compassion of Jesus for those who are lost eternally without it. That's urgent. That's urgent. That's the compassion and the drive that fills the heart of Jesus. The compassion that breaks his heart and leads him to a garden of Gethsemane where he's sweating tears, of, sweating blood, where he goes to the cross and gives himself completely and totally. The generosity we talked about last week, he who has it all because he's God himself and gives it all until he has nothing left. Why? Because his compassion and urgency of the harvest for those who are lost forever without him. That's the heart of our Savior. People with compassion, a harvest is urgent. And so then what does he do? The verse is up on the right banner. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Pray. Pray for workers. Pray for workers who have compassion, eyes of compassion. Pray for those who will see the fields in urgency and give themselves in serving those in need and proclaiming good news to those who need the good news of Jesus. Ask for workers. Pray. And we should expect that. Pray. Constant in prayer is one of our mark of discipleship. Okay. So, seeing with compassion, harvest is urgent, calling for workers. But that's not all. Then something amazing happens. And I think it's one of the, one of the neatest teachings of discipleship and mission in all the Gospels. Of what happens next. You see, our Gospel, we just read 35 to 38 of chapter 9. But, of course, it continues on into chapter 10. Now, the chapter divisions, you know, in the Bible are artificial. Those were not inspired by the Spirit. Those were just added on centuries later to help us keep track of where we're reading. So if you take that 9, 35, 38, and you keep reading into chapter 10, what does Jesus do next? It's amazing. So go on to the next one, Marty. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names, the 12 apostles, first Simon, and then on to the list. Next thing he did, he's calling apostles, disciples, and sending them out. Next screen. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. As you go, proclaim this message. 
The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do you see what he's doing? He sees the crowds with compassion. He sees the harvest as urgent. He says, pray for workers. And then he turns to the people around him and says, go work. You're the answer to the prayer. That's what he's saying to them. Go now, by word and deed, proclaiming the kingdom and then serving, in this case, even in miraculous ways. And that beautiful conclusion, freely you have received. There's that generosity we talked about last week. There's the whole grace of God. There's the compassion of God poured out on us. Freely you have received, freely give. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So this is what we are called to see. Next one, Marty. To see the people as compassion, to see the mission, the field as urgent, to pray for workers. And then we see that Jesus answers by sending us. And no visual lethargy. Let's see this as it really is. See people with compassion, see the harvest as urgent, and see ourselves as the answer to the prayer, as his disciples, his missionaries, his ambassadors, his hands and feet, his people that he's sending out. It's as though Jesus standing here instead of me saying, hey, we need workers. Ask me for workers. And then uh, you go to the vineyard, you go to that vineyard, you go to this vineyard, you go to that vineyard. And he's sending us into our everyday lives among our family, our neighbors, people we work with, other people, to serve them, to love them, to have compassion on them, and as he provides opportunity to share the good news with them as his compassionate witnesses. That's what he calls us to be. It's all about seeing Seeing the people, seeing the urgency, and seeing ourselves. Now, how do we grow in seeing and in doing? Next one, please. Brings us back to this. Back to being a disciple and growing as a disciple. Because we can't do this on our own. It's what God does in us. Jesus shaping us. He's the one who makes us more like him. And he does that as we are constant in prayer, as we are grounded in the word and seeking to apply it, as we are faithful in worship, as we join with our brothers and sisters in doing life together in spiritual relationships. He trains us, teaches us, opens our eyes to see the opportunity for loving service, giving of ourselves to others, of generously giving as we have received, that we might be his compassionate witnesses, his disciples his voice, his hands and feet in blessing the world. The banners are coming down in a couple weeks. As we enter a new time in the church year, I can't believe we're about to start Advent, but they'll come down and other decorations, other artwork to encourage us in our walk. So the banners are coming down, but the call from the Lord continues, right? We are his disciples, called to see people with compassion, to see the urgency, to see ourselves as his compassionate witnesses. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you for your compassion and that you have viewed us with compassion, with all of our faults, all of our brokenness, all of our sin. Because of your compassion, you do not sweep us away, but instead you go to the cross and die for us, and forgive us, and more than that, appoint us to be your servants and your witnesses. We need you, Lord, to be the people you call us to be, to be the blessing that you've intended us to be. We need, we need to see with your eyes. So we pray, Lord, for your spirit to give us your heart, to give us your eyes, to see the world with compassion, to see the urgency of the need, 
to move us, Lord, to see ourselves as people sent each day as your compassionate witnesses. This we pray in Jesus' name.